Okay, so let's talk about a case. Um, this is a complex case, so stay with this. There's a lot to be gained in reviewing this and staying with this with me. And the first part of this is, what does your assistant do to prepare the patient for your visit? And I've got to tell you, as you've heard before, I expect my assistants to diagnose and to let patients know at least what they see on the x-ray before I even walk in. Now this patient comes from somebody who has seen us recently and uh, felt that what we did was um, different or better or however you want to say it. And this person was seeing a person who was known as a good dentist in our area um, to get a second opinion. Now he's in his middle 70s. Uh, he describes his health as fair. Uh, he just had a cardiac ablation a month ago, which didn't work. He's got anxiety problems. He's got uh, he's had heart attacks. He has stroke. He's on um, uh, anticoagulants. Uh, his cardiologist even told him that he'd have to go off his anticoagulants to see us. No, he doesn't. We don't take patients off of anticoagulants anymore. Um, we use topical, um, topical um, um, hemostatic agents instead. But this patient has a number of problems, and these problems were already made um, known to the patient before I ever walked into the operatory. So let's take a look at the pano first. And the reason we're taking a look at the pano, which is really the panoramic version of the CT scan, is we get an appreciation for the number of teeth are meeting. We also get an appreciation for the incisal overlap. Um, and we look at how the occlusion is and how the occlusion lines up. And I'm going to go through each of these teeth individually so you can see what I'm concentrating on, and perhaps you would concentrate on that as well. And I'll go over this with the patient individually, and we try to put this plan together, but here's your first problem right here, palatal aspect of tooth number uh, two. It's asymptomatic. It goes very deep. You can see there's the crown. You can see tooth structure below the crown. So my guess is that this is external resorption from the osseous crest. It's not caries. Um, Whatever the case, the tooth is, in my opinion, non-treatable without going to root canal, and it goes so deep on the palatal root that I doubt that this would be successful, and I'm, you, you could challenge that with me. Um, we save an awful lot of teeth with external resorption, but um, this just goes a little bit too deep. But we'll talk about a strategy, a strategy in treatment right now. The point is to do the diagnosis first. Let the patient see all of the problems that are there so the patient can then ask what the solution is, but don't mix solution with the problem. At this point, we're only going through diagnostics. And what should be crossing the patient's mind was, I didn't know that. And the patient didn't know that. It's interesting that my assistant does know that, and my assistant is not a trained dental assistant at all. She trained in diagnosis with us, with me. So let's go to tooth number three and take a look what we see there. You see the apical lucency on the palatal root right here, and so you know that that tooth is a problem, right? Okay, next one is an implant, and the implant is doing quite well. This is doing great. And now we've got a big blank space. Let me just drag this over here so you can see it. Okay, so now we've got a big blank space where teeth numbers five and six are missing. They're, uh, I believe they're replaced with a partial denture um, right now. Um, okay, so now we go to number seven. By the way, five and six, the bone is good. Okay, now we go to number seven. And we look at the depth of the overlap of number seven over tooth number 27, which is there. You'll see that. We go to tooth number eight, and that's an implant that's doing quite well, but take a look at the depth of the overlap there. We're dealing with a 100% overlap on what's very close to a class two uh, malocclusion. Okay, number nine. And number nine is there. It's working okay. Number 10. Number 11, depth of overlap. And number 12, number 12 has a temporary crown on it. Let me show it to you. Okay, so it's temporary crown. I'll show it to you um, in a photograph. Yes, see the photo. Anyway, you can see the depth of the overlap now. Um, there's a temporary crown. The temporary crown actually came right off my fingers. But take a look at take a look at that. Sorry about the phone.
difficult to restore. Take a look at how these teeth line up. Very, very difficult to work with. Now, also, take into account his medical infirmity, because we've got to take that into account as far as what we can do, what we can't do. Let's look at the PAs for a moment. Let's see if there's anything else to be gained from the PAs. Probably not. Not much, except this casual relationship of tooth number uh, 12. I took the crown off number 12. There is sufficient tooth structure, but not without crown lengthening. And then he had implants, and he said he never had the implants restored. To me, these look like fractured implants. Don't they look like fractured implants to you? Anyway, he's, uh, I don't think they're restorable. I believe they're fractured implants. You might have another opinion on that. I really wouldn't know until we uncover the implants. The implants are, in my opinion, broken off at the bone line, or they are a unique design that I've never seen before. On the lower arch, we've got a fixed bridge. And fixed bridge actually fits quite well on number 18 through 20. That's doing fine. 21, that crown appears to be doing OK. 22, 23, 24, 25, 26, 27, we're doing fine until we get to 29. And take a look at 29 now. Now, he has no periodontitis anyplace else. I'm not going to share the charting with you. It's just, uh, you know, I, I could, but why? There's pus coming out of this area, and there's a deep pocket. and go down 9, 10 millimeters um, before hertium, and there's also draining fistula right in that area. What's your diagnosis here? It's a fractured root. And so we got a big post, and we don't do posts anymore. We try to stay away from posts for everything. Um, and the post will usually fracture at the end, but in the presence of no periodontal disease. Um, by the way, he was getting deep cleanings for this for this problem, and he had pus coming out of it. You've got a fractured root. And this is a fixed bridge from 29 to 31. 31 is doing, doing fine, okay? So now if we look at this case... We know that tooth number two, and well, let me go to the panoramic for a second. I think we'll see it better. You'll get the appreciation better. Okay, tooth number two. Remember, it has external resorption from the palate. Number three, an endodontic problem on a tooth that's crowned. Number four is doing well, and all the other teeth are doing okay until we get to number 12. And then 13 and 14, in my opinion, are non-restorable. Okay, on the lower arch, everything is doing okay except for that severe overlap. And we've got tooth number 29, which is failing. What do we do? Well, 29 can't be saved. So now we'll get into the treatment plan. By the way, we've, as I said, we've got to consider where he is and where he is in life. Fair prognosis, cardiac ablation doesn't work. He's actually, uh, he actually has... Uh, uh, an oxygen uh, device that he wears 24-7, he's not in the best shape. My goal is to be able to give him something to function on. All right, so what do we have right now? Tooth number two we, is non-restorable, in my opinion, due to the external resorption. Tooth number three is treatable. It's treatable with a root canal. Okay? Tooth number four is okay. So let's just look at this side. On the lower arch, tooth number 29 is failing due to the fracture, Tooth number 31 is okay. Now, what's 31 functioning against? It's functioning against tooth number 2. But tooth number 2 doesn't work. It has that external resorption. So as soon as we sever the fixed bridge here and extract this tooth, that means we've got function of, a, of an externally resorbed tooth number 2 against tooth number 31. We know that that's going to be lost. And we have no functional elements on the right side until we get to the anterior teeth. Now, that's interesting. What's going to happen? What's the force distribution going to be like? If we were to choose to extract tooth number two because it has external resorption, if we chose to do that now, then essentially we'd have no right-sided contact, and the only contacts we'd have would be on teeth numbers 10, I'm sorry, number 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, and that broken uh, temporary crown on tooth number 12. So if we decided to extract this as a functional unit, 
it's going to put a lot of stress in the anterior teeth. And a patient has a 100% overlap and has a horrible bruxing problem. I don't want to do that. Now, you could say, well, why don't you put implants in here? And you know we could. We actually could. And we may choose to do that. But right now, I want to retain a functional unit. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to sever the fixed bridge right here. Extract tooth number 29. We're going to leave tooth number 2 in place. Why? Because 2 is in contact with 31, and I want to maintain that functional contact for now. Do a root canal on tooth number 3. Now go back and place an implant number 2. When we remove this, put an implant in number 29 and put an implant in number 30. And now 29 and 30 eventually will pick up the contact with number 3 and 4. He has a partial denture up here, which right now we're going to be happy with. And once we put the crowns on the implants on numbers uh, 29 and 30, now 3 and 4 will be functional now, and only now, after that's done, can we afford now to take out tooth number two because now we've picked up the contacts on number three and four with number 29 and 30. That planning will make a big difference to him. It'll give him something to function on. Now, you could say, well, why don't you just take out all the upper teeth and do uh, upper hybrid? Well, number one is a bruxer. Number two, he has a 100% overbite. His lower teeth don't line up properly. Have you ever taken out teeth and put in implants on a patient who's a horrible bruxer? Besides that, you've got a 100% overbite here. What are you going to do? How much alveolectomy are you going to need to do in order to be able to create enough room? Can he stand to open the bite a little bit? He may be able to. But will he be able to have an immediate prosthesis placed in the upper arch that's functional? No. Right now, he's functioning on his natural teeth. I want to keep those natural teeth in place. He's sick. I want to do as little as I can in order to be able to create something that's going to work. He's got good oral hygiene, has no periodontal disease, and he has no caries and no problem around anything else other than tooth number 12, and tooth number 12 can be treated. So, how are we going to, how are we going to prep this? On the day of surgery, we're going to sever here. As I said, put the crown, put extract number 29, put an implant number 29. Put an implant in a number 30. Crown lengthen tooth number 12. Okay? Though it's, this was one surgical visit. Anesthesiologist is here because he's so infirm. Then go to the root canal specialist. Let the endodontist retreat tooth number 3. And then all the other visits are awake. We can cover 29 and 30 and put crowns on numbers 29 on the implants numbers 29 and 30. We put a crown on number, we put a surveyed crown on tooth number 12 and we make him a new upper partial denture. And we get in and we get out and with minimal surgery and he still has his natural teeth to function on. Could you debate the plan with me? Of course you could. Um, when we get all done, then we extract tooth number two um, only because tooth number two is going to become a problem. Now, could you treat the external resorption on tooth number two? Yes. You could use uh, trichloroacetic acid in that area and do endo on tooth number two. I don't think it's worth it. And once we have three and four in contact with 29 and 30, then it's superfluous. Um, but it's a separate decision. The extraction of tooth number two will be done after the rest of the functional prosthesis, or uh, after the, the uh, function is restored. And we'll take out tooth number two after that's done. Okay?